is the 2021 Toyota RAV4 Prime, and it's the second fastest car that Toyota sells. Let me repeat that. This thing, a plug-in hybrid compact crossover, is Toyota's second fastest vehicle. It has 300 horsepower, does 0 to 60 in 5.7 seconds, and it does a lot more than that, too. And today, I'm going to review the new RAV4 Prime and show you what I mean. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for buying and selling cool cars from the modern era. We've had some great sales recently on Cars and Bids, including with Tesla. We have sold many Model S and Model 3 and Model X, and we have been very, very successful selling Tesla models and, of course, other enthusiast-focused modern cars. So if you're looking to sell your Tesla or some other interest or cool car from the 1980s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to do it. And Cars and Bids listings are now on Autotempest.com. Autotempest gives you all the listings in one place, and that includes Cars and Bids. Check it out at Autotempest or CarsandBids.com. So let's talk RAV4 Prime. This is the plug-in hybrid version of the RAV4 compact crossover. There's a standard RAV4 with a gasoline engine, then there's a RAV4 hybrid with a traditional hybrid engine, and then there's this, the RAV4 Prime, which has a gas engine that's supplemented by electric motors and a plug-in hybrid capability. This thing will do about 40 miles of pure electric driving before the gas engine kicks in, which makes it perfect for people with shorter commutes. They can be on pure electric power all the time, and save the gas engine for longer trips. But while that usually sounds like a recipe for an efficient, practical, but rather boring car, this isn't that. <laughs> the RAV4 Prime has a gasoline engine with about 180 horsepower. Then it has two additional electric motors that give it a total of over 300 horsepower. Like I said, 0 to 60 in 5.7 seconds, the second fastest car Toyota sells behind only the six-cylinder Supra. This is faster than the four-cylinder Supra. So you have a mix with this car of efficiency and, surprisingly, performance-ness. And it's on sale now. The RAV4 Prime starts at just under $40,000. It comes standard with all-wheel drive, and it has a lot of other stuff, too. And today, I'll show you everything. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of the RAV4 Prime and show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the crooks and features of the RAV4 Prime with getting in, and that means discussing the key fob, which has a rather interesting quirk. You look on the key fob, you see the usual buttons lock, unlock, but there's also one marked hold AC. If you press and hold that down, it will turn on the air conditioning system in the car. Now, the benefit here is obvious. If you live in a very warm place, Texas, Arizona, you park the car in the sun, you can use that button to activate the air conditioning before you get inside, and it'll run for a few minutes before you climb it and start the car. That's pretty cool. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for heat, which would be a big benefit for people in the north and cold climates, but it's still a really neat feature to have, and it can be very helpful in cooling down the cabin on a hot day before you get inside. But anyway, next up we get into the RAV4 Prime. There are some interesting quirks and features in here, starting with the dials in this interior. They all have this, like, rubber side with this bizarre pattern. <laughs> I guess this is how Toyota makes its cars interesting and cool by putting strange patterns on the climate control and volume dials. That pattern is repeated on all the dials in this car, rather unusual, but the most interesting dial is undoubtedly this one in the center, which is used to change the drive mode and check out how it works. You turn it to the left for eco, and the top of the dial turns green. Very subtle, but it does. You turn it to the right for sport, and the top of the dial turns red. <laughs> it's a very cool-looking dial. You don't get this dial change changing colors in a lot of exotic sports cars. It's crazy to see it in a RAV4. Now, if you want to go into normal mode, you push the top of the dial, and then it turns sort of vaguely blue. But I just love playing with this dial, going from eco to sport and seeing it change colors. What a strange thing, and a cool one, frankly. But anyway, next up, above that dial, there are two buttons worth mentioning. The one on the left says Auto EV slash HV. You press that, and then the car will automatically decide whether it should be in P 
pure electric mode or hybrid mode, depending on whether it's charged, the road conditions, etc. Now, the button to the right of that says HV EV charge hold. If you press that, it will fix the car in hybrid mode, meaning the gasoline engine will come on and it will help to charge the electric motor while you drive around. That'll hold it in place. So if your electric motor is about to run out and you need more charge, you can push that button to make sure that it charges up while you drive. Now, the other interesting button in this area, below the drive mode dial, there is a button marked trail. You push trail and then a rather vague graphic of rocks shows up in your gauge cluster screen. You just see a few rocks there. Nothing else measurably occurs when that happens, although Toyota says that putting the RAV4 in trail mode changes the stability control to make it a little off-road focused, but that's pretty much it. Still, you have a trail button so you can brag to your passengers about your RAV4's off-roading capabilities. Now, next up, also in this vicinity, you will notice that the transmission has a manual mode. You can go PRND, but slide it over, and you go into sport mode, and you can shift gears up or down manually, which is unusual in the plug-in hybrid car. Also unusual, this car has paddle shifters on the steering wheel, plus and minus. It is the second fastest Toyota, so it makes sense to have some of these performance things, although it's a bit strange to use the paddle shifters because this car doesn't have a tachometer. So you're shifting with the paddle shifters, and you can kind of hear the engine, but cars today, they try to engineer that out as much as possible, so you're just guessing a little bit, but you can shift with the paddles if you want to do that. Probably most people won't. But anyway, speaking of the gauge cluster, like I said, no tachometer, but over on the left you have a gauge that functions sort of similarly to one. It shows you like what you're doing with the powertrain at any given moment. You can see on the top part it says power. The needle will go into that range when you're really flooring it and going fast. You also have eco, which I guess the needle goes into that range when you're driving economically. And on the bottom it says charge, and the needle will go there if you're actually charging the electric motor with the gasoline engine with the braking in this car. Are. Now, over on the right, standard gauges you might expect. One is a fuel gauge, pretty simple, shows you how much fuel you have left. And in the bottom right, you have a battery gauge that lets you know how much battery power you have left. All pretty simple. But in the center, <laughs> You have a little screen that shows a lot of stuff in here. It shows, for instance, your electric motor's range available, your gasoline motor's range available, your current fuel economy. It also shows the gear you're in, your current odometer reading, all of the modes you're in, the outside temperature, the current time, and your speed in both miles per hour and kilometers per hour, along with the speed limit. Frankly, it's a lot of stuff to put put in that little screen, and it looks fairly complicated and quite busy. Truthfully, what Toyota needs to do in this area of the car is just make the entire gauge cluster a screen like so many other automakers have, and that way you can spread all of this stuff out a little bit more, and the center of this screen area won't look so busy, because right now it's a lot of information in a fairly small area, and it just looks like too much. With that said, one interesting thing in this gauge cluster, you can go into the eco zone, and then while you drive, it'll let you know with a score how economically you're driving. So if you miss the fun, the thrill of driving a big V8 gas-powered sports car, well, here's a different thrill that maybe will replace it. Probably not. <laughs> But it's something to keep the time and make it more interesting while you're driving your fuel-efficient RAV4 Prime. Next up, speaking of screens in this car, there are a few more worth noting. One is the rear-view mirror, which is a screen. I'm seeing this more and more in the car industry, and it is tremendously helpful. And you can clearly see why your view in the back is not blocked by the car or rear seats or passengers. You can just see out. It's wonderful. And this rear-view mirror screen gives you the opportunity to tilt it, to move it left or right, to zoom zoom in or out. It really lets you configure it however you want, and it's just way better than your standard rear view mirror. Now, obviously, the other notable screen in this car is the one in the center, this large screen sticking up from the dashboard. This is your infotainment screen. It has pretty much all of the stuff you want. You control your radio, your navigation, all that stuff through here. And I will say this is a relatively easy system to use. I've reviewed it in several other Toyota models. Nothing particularly interesting or weird, but it's not a very elegant system. It's not cool. It's not exciting. It's very 
very functional. Everything is where you'd expect, where it needs to be, but there's no like distinctive graphics or special slidey things that happen when you move your hand around. It's just all functional, everything where it needs to go. And I must say, it can be slightly confounding sometimes to figure out exactly where you are, where you're going, whatever. It just feels maybe a little bit older, a little bit less modern than some other car infotainment screens. But generally speaking, works great, pretty responsive, just not cool or exciting. <laughs> which frankly seems about right for this car. With that said, there is one interesting feature in here. If you press this little view button to the left of the steering wheel with a camera on it, it will pull up this around the car camera view, which is a pretty cool feature at this price point, except you can see the camera quality is really not that good. Toyota went to all the trouble of putting in a very nice camera system in this car, and then they saddled it with the crappiest camera quality. It's really not helpful because the quality is so bad. However, one nice thing about this camera system, when it's showing a 360 view around the car, you can change the color of the car that is being displayed. So you can make sure that it matches your exact RAV4. I have seen these around the car cameras in a lot of different vehicles. Never seen one that lets you change the color before, except in Toyotas. That's a pretty nice touch. But anyway, the functional simplicity of this center screen is kind of generally true about this car, frankly. It's certainly true of the interior. A lot of the rivals to this car now are having swoopier interiors that have more style, more character, but you can see the RAV4s is pretty basic, pretty simple, a lot of right angles, nothing particularly exciting or interesting or visually appealing when you get in here. It's fine, it's nice, it looks good, it's just not like attractive or cool or special. It's just simple. That's how this car is. Although, for such a relatively simple vehicle, it has an unreal owner's manual. Look at the size of this. This is one of the largest owner's manual pouches I have ever seen in any car ever. This is just a RAV4. <laughs> Why does it need all this crap? And I have to say, although some of this is like warranty information and things like that, a lot of it is just owner's manual. You get three separate owner's manual booklets in this car, two for the car, and then a quick start guide because they know nobody is going to read all that stuff. This is just insane <laughs> over owner's manualing, but that's what you get, I guess. And next up, we move on to the back seat in the RAV4. And I gotta tell you, it is roomy back here. Now, the RAV4 is kind of stretching the definition of a compact SUV these days. It's gotten bigger and bigger over the years, but call it whatever you want. It has a roomy interior. The front seat, the driver's seat, is where I would sit comfortably if I was driving. And frankly, I'm comfortable in the back too, which I almost never can say about compact crossovers. This thing is really fantastic in terms of legroom and obviously headroom. I've got several inches my head before it hits the ceiling. This is well done. It is impressive how roomy this is back here. Now, other interesting quirks in the back. One is the red stitching. This applies to the front seat too, but it's especially interesting to see it in back. You have these red stitched patterns across the backrest. You also have this red line going down from the headrest. The headrest is also red stitched and you have red stitching on the door. This is what you would expect from a true performance automobile which at least in the Toyota lineup, <laughs> this is frankly. So there's red stitching everywhere to make that point. Now, other interesting items you'll find in the back, you have two charge ports back here, which of course is nice to see. You pop them open, you can charge your devices and you have heated seats back here. To turn them on, you press the little heated seat button on the door and then you have your heated rear seats. That's a nice feature, especially in a compact SUV. You don't see that all that often. And next up, we move on to the cargo area. You pop this open after it beeps at you. And you can see this is, once again, pretty roomy back here. Again, impressively so, especially for a compact crossover. This is a nice large cargo area where you can stick a lot of stuff. I'm surprised how much space is back here, especially considering how much space is in the back seat. Usually you sacrifice rear seat room for cargo area or vice versa, but this car seems to have both. Two other things interesting in the cargo area. One, you have a power outlet back here, a regular household style one. You can plug in stuff, which is a nice feature. And you also have this little light. You press this switch and you can turn on this very dim light. <laughs> so if you need to get back here at night and you need to see what's going on, you can turn this on and illuminate basically nothing, but at least it's there, a little light you can turn on in your cargo area. 
With that said, one other item worth noting back here, you don't have the ability to fold down the rear seats from the back of the car. Some cars have that feature power operator. You push a button and the seats automatically fold down, but this one doesn't even have like a mechanical release for the rear seats. If you want to drop the rear seats, you have to go around individually to the seats and put them down in order to create a larger flat load floor back here. And finally, we move under the hood and you can see where the magic happens. Sort of. What you see under here is mostly the gasoline engine, which is a 2.5 liter four cylinder, about 180 horsepower. Where the magic actually happens is when this engine is mated to the electric motors in this car for a total of more than 300 horsepower. I have said this several times down this review, but it really is worth noting because it's amazing how much power Toyota has put into this little crossover. And you might be wondering why? Why did they do this? Well, the truth is it's pretty easy to get power out of electric vehicles, a lot easier than in gas powered cars. In a gas powered car, you go way up in horsepower. You also go way down in fuel economy. That's not really true with electric cars. You can go way up in performance without really a major loss to the car's efficiency. And so you can put 300 horsepower in a RAV4 and still have a pretty efficient vehicle. But you're probably still wondering why. You get why electric cars can have more power, but why did Toyota make a RAV4 this fast? Frankly, I think the answer is Tesla. Tesla has been making all of its electric cars not only electric and futuristic, but fast and fun. And so Toyota looks at that and says, why not make the RAV4 faster and more exciting if we're doing a plug-in electric version? You might as well, we might as well try to start competing with Tesla and not quite be as conservative anymore. And so that's why I think you have a RAV4 that does zero to 60 in 5.7 seconds. And frankly, the same is generally true with the styling. You look at this car and you see it's so angular and muscular. And truthfully, this is just a normal compact crossover. So why did they do that? Once again, I think this is Toyota looking at the trends and making a change. Not Tesla this time, but off-roader SUVs. Toyota has been very successful with the 4Runner and with the Tacoma. And they realize that people are looking for like adventure type vehicles vehicles, so they made the RAV4 look like one. That's why you have squared off wheel arches and just a more aggressive, bolder design than previous RAV4 models. It's not really an off-roader SUV, but it looks more like one than its rivals, and that's really popular right now. So Toyota decided to give the RAV4 sort of an off-roader styling treatment to piggyback on that popularity. Frankly, it makes sense, and so does the power. And so those are the quirks and features of the Toyota RAV4 Prime. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the RAV4 Prime. By the way, this is called the RAV4 PHEV and other markets. They call it the Prime here to align it with the Prius Prime, which is also a plug-in hybrid. Now there's two things I wanna talk about before I drive this car. One is uh, the all-wheel drive situation. So because this car has electric motors front and rear, it comes standard with all-wheel drive. I had mentioned that earlier, but just sort of in passing, and I wanted to really drive the point home because this is a pretty expensive vehicle for a RAV4. It's over $40,000, uh, starts just under, but equipped, it's like 43, 44. And that's a lot of money for a RAV4, but it does come standard with all-wheel drive. So that's not an option. You will have to add later. Now, the other thing I wanted to cover with this car <laughs> is why I'm reviewing it. So uh, I already did the newest RAV4 and you know, why bother with the plug-in version? Well, I wasn't going to review this car. Then I started getting requests for it and requests and requests and requests. People wanted to see the RAV4 Prime. So let's talk driving experience. Normally, when you're just cruising around day to day, it just seems like a totally normal RAV4, frankly. Um, it doesn't even seem, you know, it's not like an ultra luxury RAV4, it's not an ultra whatever. There's nothing particularly interesting or unusual about it. Um, you do, obviously it operates a little quieter when it's on full electric mode, but you know, other than that, which is true of basically every EV, it's just a RAV4. It just feels and drives like a RAV4. The only thing where it really starts to become different and special is when you floor it, in which case, I mean, it just, it feels quick. Even at 50, 60 and you floor it, it it's impressive. Now I should say it feels quick for a RAV4. You know, I just recently reviewed the Audi SQ5 and I said that didn't feel very quick. Well, that does zero to 60 a second faster than this, but that is pitched as a performance car. This is like a plug-in crossover. And you know, the RAV4 is sort of the ultimate symbol of like the 
the non-car enthusiast car. Well, here's a version with over 300 horsepower. So my view on this thing, I mean, it's interesting. You know, the rest of the car, though, doesn't really match up to this performance. It's sort of like some Tesla models in that respect. Like, you have this incredible acceleration, but then it still steers and handles like a RAV4. Like, the steering is still pretty vague and RAV4-y. And the handling, I mean, they didn't really, it's not like they threw sport suspension or high performance brakes on this car. Like it feels like a Toyota RAV4, to be totally honest. But when you floor it, you really do get that sensation of like, wow, this is a pretty impressive vehicle. And honestly, for this price point, this is not the most well-appointed car, you could say. There's a lot of plastic in here. It's fine, but it's not like nice. It's not like really nice and high quality. So overall, I have to say this car, Truthfully, it's, it's relatively boring. You, you see the numbers on paper and it's and it's interesting and you accelerate in the car and it's impressive, but otherwise, and, but that wears off relatively quickly and otherwise there's not too much to it that a car enthusiast I think would really enjoy. Where this car is gonna be successful is, you know, people who want a RAV4, but they're starting to embrace the plug-in cars, the hybrids, you know, um, they want to go one step beyond the regular RAV4 hybrid or the CRV hybrid. Well, here's your chance to do a plug-in RAV4. And there's a lot of people interested in that, uh, as proven by the fact that this car is selling. And so that's the Toyota RAV4 Prime. This car has been popular, sales have been strong, and Toyota has had a hard time making enough to meet demand. That's no surprise because this is a good combination of practical and efficient and powerful and good technology, frankly. And now it's time to give the RAV4 Prime a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the RAV4 Prime is fine. I think the latest RAV4 is a bit odd looking, but the general public seems to like it and it gets a 5 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 5.7 seconds and it gets a 4 out of 10. Handling is fine for a car like this and it gets a 3 out of 10. Fun factor is surprisingly okay. This is Toyota's fastest four-door vehicle and it's reasonably exciting to stomp on the throttle. It gets a 3 out of 10. Finally, cool factor, and it's not especially cool, just an electrified RAV4 and it gets a 1 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 16 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It's reasonably well equipped, although not full of all the latest tech, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort is fine, normal for a car like this, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is good, materials are okay, and reliability has to be assumed to be good based on Toyota's track record, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Practicality is excellent with good interior room, good cargo space, and now the benefit of some electric components to boost fuel economy, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Finally, value, and this is a good value, though somewhat expensive, starting at just over $39,000, but there are a lot of benefits, and this gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 34 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is 50 out of 100, which places the RAV4 here against rivals. It ties the Volkswagen ID4, which is surely one of its closest competitors. The RAV4 is more engaging to drive, but the ID4 is more interesting and cooler with more features and better tech. Choosing between them is a tough call, and it depends on whether you're looking for an EV or a plug-in hybrid, but I think the RAV4 Prime makes a very compelling case for itself.